Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first joint digital talk with the Benjamin Franklin House in London. My name is Kevin Butterfield. I'm the executive director of the library at, at Mount Vernon, the Washington Library. And in advance of, of Constitution Week, which is coming up next week for us here in the United States, uh, we're looking forward to having an illuminating discussion of the relationship between arguably the two most influential and important men at the convention. Uh, people might say James Madison, people might name others, but Benjamin Franklin and George Washington had a towering and utterly significant presence in the formation of the American government that we've come to know. And I'm looking forward to watching this conversation with an old friend of Mount Vernon's, Dr. Ed Larson, uh, one of the inaugural fellows of the Washington Library when it first opened its doors in 2013, and someone who has joined us before to talk about his uh, important work on the founding era. He'll be joined in conversation with Dr. Marcia Balciano, the director of the Franklin House in London. I'm looking forward to learning from the conversation with the two of them. One note I do want to mention is an upcoming event just next week. Uh, we have a, a, a good number of events coming around during Constitution Week, but we're going to have one that's not focused on political issues or the founding of our government, uh, but in fact, uh, looking at the colonial era and the art and artifacts of that time. Uh, Richard Dietrich will be joining uh, uh, our own Dr. Susan Shelwer in conversation about his work on a lifetime of collecting colonial American art and artifacts. And I'm looking forward to that conversation on September 15th. That will be our forward evening book talk uh, for the month of September. Well, thank you so much for coming together. I want to invite Dr. Marcia Balasiano to uh, the conversation and hand things over to you. Marcia, it's great uh, that you could join us from London. Thank you, Kevin. It's a real pleasure to take part in this session today. I'm going to step aside and let you welcome uh, Dr. Larson to the stage. That sounds great. Thank you. Well, just in case people don't know, it's probably incumbent on me to say something about Benjamin Franklin House. We are located in the center of London, and it's the only house still standing where Benjamin Franklin lived and worked. He lived there between 1757, and with the exception of a brief time back in Philadelphia, he stayed until just before the revolution. I know a lot about Benjamin Franklin, and I know something about George Washington, um, but not as, not, not as much as my esteemed colleagues at Mount Vernon. But uh, Edward Larson, who is a distinguished university professor of history and the uh, daily chair in law at um, Pepperdine University, has brought these two individuals together, Franklin and Washington, in a very exciting new book. And it is my pleasure to welcome the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Ed Larson, to join me as we talk about these two fascinating individual. So welcome, Ed. Thank you very much. I wish I could be with you in London. Well, I think I would rather be in sunny California, <laughs> um, although today it's not raining in London, so uh, that, that's a good thing. Well, Ed, I wanted to start by asking you what got you interested in these two figures? And what struck me is that when you read uh, about their stories and their uh, amazing feats, Washington, in the case of a biography on Franklin, is definitely in the mix, but he's just one of the players. And likewise, uh, reading something about Washington, Franklin uh, has to be mentioned, but not until you decided to put these two characters together did they really feature in such a strong way. That's true. I would agree with that's the assessment. When you read about Washington, Franklin is there. When you read about Franklin, Washington's there. They're, they're both there. Uh, but partly because they're such different people, we don't think of them necessarily together. And yet, take a step back. When you look at anything about the Revolutionary War or the coming of the Revolution, um, or the period all the way around the Confederation, that whole period, they are the two preeminent players. It doesn't matter what historian you look at. Even back then, you don't even have to go to a historian. Back then, uh, Jefferson once commented, look, I'm important, Adams is important, some of the others, but we're not in the same league with Washington and Franklin. They are the uh, fathers of the country. And Adams said much the same thing. 
um, Adams, of course, he does it always in sort of a nasty way. But he said, all they're going to remember about this is about the revolution is uh, Franklin threw down a lightning bolt and up popped George Washington and we were independent. Um, and it wasn't just them. You could go beyond it. People at the time, historians ever since and historians today, you can see it in, in the accounts. Just name the top historians of the revolutionary era and they will all say that Franklin and Washington are in a class by themselves. Now, everybody says that. It's, all, it's, it's in every textbook. So what I was thinking is I taught American history for years, and what I've always tried to do is look for sort of holes in the writing. Um, rather than write another biography of John Adams, as great as that is, I don't think I can beat McCollum. Um, I'm not going to write another biography of Hamilton because I don't think I can beat Ron Chernow. But if there seem to be holes that people have left open, and since Franklin and Washington are universally agreed, and that would come, Chernow would say the same thing. Ellis, they all say it. Um, would, if you, if, how did they interact? And so I originally came to the topic I did not know how much they would interact. I came with it as a little bit of a leadership study question. I had been a leadership study student under James McGregor Burns and early in my career, I've always been interested in leadership studies. Here were the two preeminent leaders of the American Revolution and ones that it would not have succeeded. They're the two indispensable men without Washington in the battlefield and Franklin doing the negotiating. Um, well, just think of Yorktown. Um, Washington had had the courage to bring his troops down. Yorktown was the critical battle. Washington had the uh, had had the courage to bring his troops down from what New York, but Franklin had to get the French Navy there and the French Army. And without the French Navy and French Army, the British would have won because they just would have sailed away. Um, most of the troops, more than half of the troops, besieging a Yorktown. Don't count the Navy, just the Army. More than half the troops were French. So both of these, and of course, Franklin kept getting loans. So I was interested in how they worked together because they had to work together. And both of them, I had come to know, didn't, I mean, they had a strong ego in a way, but they weren't, they were both comfortable in their own skin. They weren't like Adams. They weren't thin skinned. They were, that's a funny thing to say because they both took slights very seriously, but they both freely gave credit to others. They were very generous in their, in the way they worked with other people. They had a very different leadership style, say, than John Adams. And um, I was interested in that. And so I was wondering how they worked together because they were both generous people. And uh, so I thought, well, let's just see how they work together. And I didn't know how close the relationship, how it went back so far. It went back to the French and Indian War when they started working together in a very significant way and continued right up to Franklin's death. So that's what I was interested in. I was trying to look at that. What I had to see must have been a gap because they were so central, and yet not many historians actually actively talk about how they work together in practice. Well, Ed, I wanted to ask you the next question, uh, but I want to um, read this quote that you referred to because I think it's so fantastic. It was uh, by John Adams to Benjamin Rush, actually in the very month of 1790 that Franklin died, April. And he says that the essence of the whole will be that Dr. Franklin's electrical rod smote the earth and out sprang General Washington that Franklin electrified him with his rod, and thenceforward these two conducted all the policy, negotiations, legislation, and war. Uh, Adams is not usually credited with having a sense of humor, but <laughs> we might have to give him that. Uh, so can you tell us about how the relationship began? When, when do we need to look back to, to kind of see that first interaction between these two men? The first interaction was during the French and Indian War, so-called French and Indian War, Seven Years War is how it's called in, in Europe, which actually started, even though it's a global war, the first, I suppose, the first truly global war, the Seven Years War, since by that time, France and, and England were global um, powers with 
colonies all over and they fought worldwide and they brought in allies. But it actually started in the what were then called the Forks of the Ohio, what we now say is Western Pennsylvania around um, the town of uh, the city of Pittsburgh. Um, that's where the Allegheny and the Mungahela come together and form the Ohio River. And the, that had been traditionally claimed under the colonial charters by both Pennsylvania, which charter reads um, basically the boundaries of Pennsylvania going west, and Virginia, because the old Virginia charter uh, used, uh, I think it was the Potomac River going at the, as the northern boundary, and the Potomac River turns north. And so both of these places claimed the fourth forks of the Ohio, which all colonists realized was a very rich, it was across the Appalachian, so it was a little tough to reach, but a very rich potential agricultural area. Now, the France by this time had settled both Louisiana and um, Canada, and the way they connect was all this way around the Great Lakes. And so right then in the 1750s, they decided, well, let's take the Ohio country so we can have a closer connection between Quebec and, and, and New Orleans um, right down the Ohio River. And so they sent troops in and they had Native Americans who were their allies. The, the British had some Native Americans who were their allies. Um, they tended to get along better with the Pennsylvania, the Native Americans, because the Quakers of, and the government of Pennsylvania tended to negotiate rather than attack the Native Americans. Um, it was in the nature of their religion. And um, when the war broke out over Pittsburgh, over the forks of the Ohio, there were Pennsylvania and Virginia settlers both projected there. And now the French and their Native American allies started attacking them. Well, to defend them, Pennsylvania turned to its most distinguished citizen, who was about 50 by then, Ben Franklin, who had risen up and was head of the opposition in the legislature. Um, also had become wealthy by that time and was known as incredibly clever and smart. And he was head of the opposition, the non-Quaker party in the legislature. And the Quakers all left the legislature because they couldn't fight the war. And so Franklin became effectively the governor of the, of the state. I mean, there wasn't appointed governor, but it was effectively Franklin. And he was head of the militia. He was assigned to create an army. He became the colonel. That's the highest rank there was. He was in charge of the Pennsylvania militia. And he walked, marched out there with his troops and built the forts and was the military leader of, of Pennsylvania during the war. He was very clever. He put, he knew right where to put the forts and to, uh, and he was because he could figure those things out. Washington, meanwhile, younger, but his brother had died. His brother had been the colonel in charge of the Virginia militia, and those things in Pennsylvania in Virginia tend to be hereditary. So it went to Washington. He was the next in line. That's how he got Mount Vernon, by the way. Um, his brother died. Lawrence died, and that left Mount Vernon to him as the next. Eventually, left it to him as the next um, male heir when all of Lawrence's children died. And so Washington became the colonel in charge of the Virginia militia. And so they were both in charge and they were defending the exact same territory because they both had claims of it. And so they started working together during the French and Indian War. And this is where they first speak both. Well, Franklin was already famous. I shouldn't say that. He'd already published his electrical papers. He was already famous. But that's when Washington first became famous. He wrote a journal of his accounts going up to try to deal with the French. That was published worldwide. And interestingly, here's an interesting little tidbit. It was published by Franklin in Franklin's newspaper. Franklin had a whole chain of, you know, had newspapers and printing houses all over. Um, but he published it in his Pennsylvania one. But not only did he publish it, but he published Washington's journal of his trip up to work with the French, uh, negotiate with the French. Around, if you look at the paper, around in the middle of Washington's journal, uh, reprinted in Franklin's newspaper, was the first political cartoon ever in America, ever in the United States, uh, designed by Franklin, carved and put in his newspaper, the famous snake cut up into pieces and say, join or die or unite or die. And New England cut off from Virginia, cut off from South Carolina. That was Franklin's great cartoon, world still known, around Washington's journal article. And they're both saying the same thing. We have got to unite. And it was a theme they stuck with. It was a theme they carried to the convention. 
if you have one idea fix, as they say in, in, liter in, in music, that these colonies have to work together. And they all brought the two of them who worked together in the French and Indian War. That's when they first got to know each other. Um, they both advised Braddock, don't march out to Pittsburgh you know, or Fort Duquesne, it was called then. He'll be slaughtered. And of course, General Braddock famously said, oh, you know, they hurt your little colonial militia, but we'll do just fine. Of course, famous last words, he was killed and his people were sliced and sliced up by the Native Americans fighting from the um, uh, from the woods against these line of red coat soldiers. Um, but they all learned, Franklin and Washington learned some key things. First, they learned that the colonies needed to work together. They could never be anything separately. They also were slighted. They were, they both had an enormous impact and yet Franklin then, and especially famously later in Washington, but Washington then when he tried to get a, here he was fighting as a colonel in Virginia militia and he wanted to be a, get a British um, commission like his brother had had, um, Lawrence. And the British wouldn't give him one. So he was under every, off, every British officer even though he was a colonel in charge of the Virginia militia, he was under all the Virginia, and that, that galled him. And they both learned they could never, despite their enormous abilities, and both were very comfortable in their skin, both knew they were very special people. They could never get credit from the British. They would always be colonial yokels. So they learned union. They learned they could never reach their potential. And Franklin, by this time, had figured out that America was going to have Americans, the British colonies in America were going to have more people than England sometime. Why shouldn't we be represented in Parliament? Why can't we all be together under the king? He was arguing for those things. They also learned finally with Braddock's defeat that the British could be beat in frontier fighting because it was the Virginia militia that fought best at, the, at Braddock's defeat. And so they all learned the British could be defeated in frontier fighting. So those are three key lessons they learned together. And then, of course, when they get back together next, um, there's some connection and correspondence in between. But they both go their separate ways, Franklin to uh, Philadelphia, where he continued to rise, uh, and his time in England. Um, uh, uh, Washington takes over and, and makes his turns around his Mount Vernon plantation from a failed tobacco plantation to a successful uh, 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 grain uh, growing plantation with a mill. Um, and he, he, they go their separate ways. But when they come next, come back together at Second Continental Congress um, in 1775, they were by far the two most important delegates. Everybody awaited their arrival. And others were coming, Adams, others, but nobody was like Washington coming from Virginia met with military escorts, and Franklin sailing in dramatically from England, gre greeted with church bells ringing and cannons booming. They were the two signal people, and then they worked together very closely because, what, in fact, Franklin proposes Washington as the commander-in-chief, and they worked together very closely on all the committees, uh, both viewed as military background, both as because of the French and Indian War, viewed as the, the lead people with military, so they're on every military committee, together. Franklin's on every diplomatic committee, and they work very, very closely until Washington goes off to lead the troops in the siege of Boston. And Washington, and Franklin, who then becomes head of the military committees, he goes up and meets with Franklin in, uh, in Cambridge, which was Cambridge, um, uh, Massachusetts, which was the headquarters of the, of the American uh, uh, forces besieging Boston. So they work together there. They work together again in New Jersey before Franklin finally goes over to France. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that you should be getting us your questions. Please type them in, and we will hope to get to some of those before the end of the show today. But uh, I think that's really fascinating to think about Franklin in his military garb, <laughs> because we don't necessarily think of Franklin as being, you know, in all his um, accolades and all the different things he, he did, being someone that was familiar with defense and uh, being in the military is not something we tend to think about. But as you say, they were both colonels. And I think it's a really interesting jumping off point for looking at their similarities and their differences. And one of the things that you bring out is that 
um, when they were working um, in the very early stages, both as the colonels of their respective colonial militias, uh, you had Washington enforcing discipline with his men. You had Franklin very much, a man of the people, sleeping with his men. You also talk about at the beginning of the book, um, Garb in particular, with Franklin really uh, enjoying having a very humble costume, but Washington having something that was far grander. And yet Franklin talked a lot about humility, particularly in the early stages or pursued that um, in his 13 virtues at the early part of his life, which he describes in his autobiography. But he did turn down many of the uh, things that were offered to him where Washington, who did like maybe a little bit more pomp and circumstance, he was turning down things. He didn't necessarily, it was, you get the sense that he was really reluctant to come on to the, to the world stage as he was, uh, but he had this strong sense of duty as, as they both did. So can you talk a little bit about kind of what brings them uh, together in terms of their personalities and, and what separates them? They did have, you, you captured it well, they did have that difference in their personality. Remember, um, Washington was from Virginia and as John Adams, who I think has a wonderful wit, it's a biting, bitter wit, but it's a wonderful wit. I think he said of, speaking of Washington in particular, but spreading it to all Virginians, he said, uh, in Virgi what was it? In Virginia, all um, our geese are, all geese are swans. Um, how they do preen and prance. And, and you need to do that in Virginia society. You need to show your uh, status uh, in the way you act. Um, but, but that said, Washington was, um, always listened to others, always listened more than he spoke, always took the counsel of his lieutenants um, and his um, and others. He was always very deferential to his people above him, um, like Lord Fairfax, um, and expected deference from those below him, even though he listened to them and always gave them credit. He didn't steal credit from them. Um, Franklin was similar in that respect, in that he did show respect to those. And of course, in a way, Washington looked to Franklin as a little bit, because he was a half generation older, as his superior. And so he treated him with respect as he would a person older, um, always. Um, but Franklin grew up as a, well, he was in a poor family in Boston, indentured servant, fled indentured servitude, uh, and by the strength of his intelligence, ability, his creativity, is able to work with other people. He moves himself forward in Pennsylvania society till he becomes one of the wealthiest people there. Um, but he has this humility, um, and I don't know. I mean, he never viewed himself as inferior. He recognized his incredible talent. He was very comfortable in his own skin. Uh, he, and so you could call it a false humility. Um, in the sense that it was for show, he said either you know either either be um, be humble or at least look like you're humble, um, and he did do that. And in fact, in the military, he hated wearing the fancy garb, and his men loved him. His men absolutely loved him. They trusted him. They marched with him. His wife would send food, and he passed it out to all the other people. He'd sleep on the floor with them even though everybody knew he was wealthy and important and a famous writer and, you know, the electrical papers had already come out. He was world famous, but the men loved him and they'd try to parade for him. And he would like, he wouldn't say when he was coming back into town because he didn't want the military greeting. Um, it was only a couple times he got, he got snookered into having the, the Royal the guard of all the, the soldiers march with him. He didn't like doing that. He liked to be, and which was the opposite of Washington. Washington's men respected him, um, but during the during the time in Virginia as a uh, colonial officer, you know they they had their differences. I mean, he was a stern he was a stern taskmaster, while Franklin was a generous one. Um, but yet they respected each other's ability. And uh, Franklin, you know, Franklin really thought that Washington had an enormous creative ability and trusted him with military planning and um, would would uh, say, would compliment him both directly. And you read his letters, he is constantly, after the battles in New York, which go so badly, 
Franklin sends him letters from France, bucking him up, saying, I share your plans with the French generals and they admire you so greatly. Uh, he, he was ready to, he was willing to commit to him. And he, unlike Adams, who had flipped over and was arguably part of the, uh, the group that were trying to take out Washington and replace him with Horatio Gates, Franklin stuck by Washington all the way. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he recognized ability. He was also, um, the, and they were comfortable. They never, there was never any grousing. There was, I never saw in all the writings, in all the comments, either of them say a single bad word about the other one. And where you read some of, there was a lot of backbiting and bickering, whether it was Jefferson or, or Adams or the Lees, um, amongst the colonial leaders. And you never find that as a characteristic of Franklin and, and, and Washington. Indeed, uh, when when people came out after Franklin, uh, like like an Adams, uh, Franklin would just shake his head and said, I just sort of pity the poor guy. <laughs> so one important way that they diverged, uh, which you bring out in the book, is on their position on slavery. And it's a topical question as we look at the unrest in the United States um, in relation to not only the um, events of recent months, um, the rise of Black, Black Lives Matter as an um, important movement. You have Franklin going through a trajectory on slavery being accepting of it because he was uh, born, something he was used to um, and maybe being a bit apathetic and then over time changing his views. Uh, you also highlight that Franklin was apprenticed to his brother James, which didn't go well and he really, uh, it didn't go uh, so well that he decided to run away and uh, much to the pleasure of Philadelphia, his adopted city, that's where he chose uh, to make his life except for the times that he lived in London and then in France as the first representative of the fledgling United States. Um, but he, through lots of different reasons, he comes to see this as something that um, he no longer can abide. So he eventually releases his slaves that he had. Um, and then, of course, we know that one of his last public acts was to serve as the president of the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery or for the promotion of the abolition of slavery. Uh, Washington also, at his death, uh, you bring out, made his, uh, you know, decided in his will to release his slaves. Um, so, but he didn't come out publicly, could have had a, a better effect, and they both had to be, they had to make a choice and had to be pragmatists, I guess, to get the Constitution done. It wasn't a foregone conclusion that that would happen, but we all paid the price for it. Um, and, you know, as we can see, the, the legacy um, is is a, is a strong one and uh, it deserves the, the, the reflection and the consideration that we now in 2020 are, are giving to this topic. So. How did, how, what do you think about that in terms of the research? And do you think that Washington might have come out more strongly? Would, would that have changed anything in terms of the trajectory of, of the Constitution or um, on the American experience with slavery? Well, that's a very important question. It's an important question then, um, back now. Um, Franklin's life gives the lie to the charge that well, everybody back then had slaves and um, therefore slavery was fun. Um, you know, you can't really judge the people by today's standards. And I, I agree. I agree with those people who say you can't judge people back then by today's standards. But Franklin shows, and others, not just Franklin, Franklin shows that we don't have to judge them by today's standards. We can judge them by their standards. Um, and Franklin shows people can change. Now, to sort of, you know, to get into the subject, you do have to, I'm, um, I'm not saying any slavery is good by any means, but there was, all through history, there was slavery. 
doesn't matter whether you're talking about ancient Rome or ancient China or ancient Africa. Um, all of Europe had slavery, but they had slavery about like you had it in Philadelphia. This was an institution. There were some slaves. There were a whole lot of serfs um, uh, in Russia or an equivalent of serfs in England um, and indentured servants. And those were a range of sort of, uh, of, of enslaved conditions, lack of freedom. But then you have something entirely different and novel develop in uh, the 1600s in the sugar colonies of the Caribbean. And um, that is true chattel slavery, as it became known. And it doesn't matter. It was in English islands like Barbados. Um, it was in the French colonies like um, Hispaniola. It was in the, and later New Orleans. It was in the Dutch uh, colonies, islands down there. It was in Port British, uh, Portuguese Brazil. It was in the Spanish colonies. And then it spreads to the American South in the late 1600s. And this is true the chattel slavery that we envision as the this and it spread to South Carolina first and the rice, uh, New Orleans, the sugar, um, and then on up into Virginia with tobacco plantations, which is where Washington encountered it. And these slaves were truly treated like animals. They were brutes. Uh, they were um, they and there were all the restrictions that we envision with the horrors of slavery. Now, you have to wonder how much did Franklin encounter that or people in England? Now, that doesn't mean the slavery that they had in Boston and in Philadelphia wasn't bad, of course, and the Quakers turned against it. Now, Franklin early on is the first printer who will publish the anti-slave writings of the Quakers in the early, early um, 1700s. And then he begins supporting putting money behind, serving on the board for schools for, for black children, both slave, and in fact, his, his own slaves were sent to those schools. Um, so they got an education. Um, of course, in chattel slavery that you had in the South, the slaves couldn't get, they couldn't read. They, they would be, it would be against the law to teach them to read or to marry. Franklin's slaves were able to marry. It was a different sort of slavery. I'm not justifying it, but it was so, it, it was on a blur, on a range from indentured servitude. But he turns against that as well. He writes, he, 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 um, he eventually, as it says, he, he no longer has slavery. He becomes communicating with the anti-slave leaders in England while he's there. He works working very closely with the anti-slave, uh, like Erasmus Darwin and the other British anti because the anti-slave movement really gets going while he is in England. And that's a critical time. See, Frank Washington never had that experience. And he's meeting with these people in England. And that's when he really starts turning. And he's finally convinced when he's in France, when he's serving as a diplomat in France. And he's meeting with, because they were really turning against slavery in a big way. And he sends over Lafayette to become Washington's assistant. He gets to know Lafayette. He sends him over. He sends a letter of uh, invitation. And Lafayette is a big opponent of slavery. And Lafayette pleads with Washington to free his slaves, as do others. Hamilton never owned slaves. And um, Lawrence, another one of Washington's aides. And they plead with Washington as an example during this revolution. Free your slaves. You're the great leader. And he gets letters from Quakers urging him to free his slaves, that it can make a difference then. And maybe in that revolutionary time, I, you know, I can't second guess history, but it might have made a difference if Franklin and Washington had joined forces along with Mason and others and and freed their slaves and the revolutionary period. Washington waiting as long as he did um, till his death and then by then has come uh, the cotton gin has come along and there's a new economic basis for slavery. And the revolutionary period is sort of passed by um, 1800 when the death becomes widely known and his will, it becomes widely known. Um, and Jefferson is president. Uh, the window may have passed by that time. And the fact that it wasn't, there was no public statement of why he particularly freed his slaves. So that both Northerners, pro-slavery um, uh, Southerners and anti-slavery Northerners could read their own meaning into Washington's act. It simply didn't have the impact it would have had earlier. But again, um, 
it may not have made a difference, even if he'd done it earlier. But by the 1800 and by the coming of the cotton gin, the window of opportunity for opposing slavery had passed. So I enjoyed learning a little bit about the quest for Canada in your book. Oh. And I thought it was quite interesting because Washington and, of course, um, Franklin were trying to convince the Canadians to get on board on the side of the Americans. And what they were proposing for the Canadians, and which they were very dismayed that the Canadians didn't understand the benefits of, really you see in the laying of uh, the principles upon which the United States were were built. So uh, promising a free press, liberty for all, freedom of conscious, um, conscience, Republican self-governance. What happened? Why, why weren't they successful? Especially it surprises me always that the things that these very important figures from history were unsuccessful at, alongside, of course, the myriad things that they were successful at. That's a wonderful observation. And, you know, no one's asked me about that. And I did find that, an, like you, I found that absolutely fascinating. Both Franklin and Washington believed that what the United States were doing was a revolutionary transformation that would not be limited just to the American colonies. They truly, they were both children in the Enlightenment. They truly believed in... Um, popular rule in Republican government. Uh, Franklin, of course, right after the Constitutional Convention, of course, sends the Constitution to, over to people he knows in England, Europe and says, you guys want, you might want to do this. Get all your countries together into a, a Republican Union. But even as early as the Revolutionary War, they both thought that this idea that they believed in of popular rule of Republican government would spread. And so they were, it was, and, and Canada was a place that really brought them together. They both tried to push on to Bermuda, the Bahamas, Bermuda, um, other colonies in the, toward the Caribbean. Um, and they, so that would be another example. But Canada is a great one because Washington sends dispatches, a significant part of his army um, from the siege of Boston and sends them up, up through Maine um, to to attack Quebec. And another significant force is sent up uh, through the through New, upstate New York to successfully con con conquer Montreal and then go up and meet. The idea was they would meet in Quebec and take the fortress of the Quebec. But they thought that the people would rise up and join them with this promise of liberty. And Franklin went with them. Franklin, he was, he was because he was viewed, he knew French, and he was viewed as having being a good spokesman. And he was viewed as um, the fear they had with Canada is these are all um, Catholics. And they will view, they'll be turned off by the New Englanders who are such, who are so anti-Catholic and so, so much tied in with the Puritans. And so Franklin's very open to Catholics. They send another delegate who is Catholic, one of the members of the Constitution, uh, the Confederation Congress, or the back then it would be the Second Continental Congress, who is Catholic from Maryland, uh, and so Franklin goes up, who you know, who speaks French and and is um, friendly toward Catholicism, and they th they thought that being up there they could help. And Franklin, you know, is an old man by this time, traveling on, through a war scene, sleeping in in the open in burnout um, burnout homes where the battle had raged. And then trying to talk with these these Canadians about joining the American Revolution. But you're right, it, it fails, but it surprises them because they thought these people would rise up. But they do announce both Washington's letter that is pro a proclamation that is read throughout there by the army and Franklin's own comments. They're pushing just what you're saying. They're pushing. We will give. Don't worry about us taking away your freedom of religion. We will guarantee your right to be Catholic. We will guarantee your freedom of religion. We won't establish a religion on you because that was a big fear. Um, and we will protect that. We'll protect your freedom of the press. We'll protect your freedom. And they're announcing all the things, the things that could make this, 
because you know we really didn't have any Catholic colonies. Maybe Maryland originally was sort of had a Catholic element, but by this time, even Maryland, which did send a Catholic to, uh, delegate to uh, Philadelphia, and that delegate actually was the Catholic who went with Franklin. Um, you know, even Maryland was mostly Protestant by this time. But here you said, you know, Canada. So they're announcing the things that would make a, a United States as a um, continental. This is way before the Constitutional Convention. The things that they foresaw would make America a successful continental republic. Let each state have its own social rules. And, you know, that's a problem with slavery in the South. Does that move as a social matter and let each state decide it? But also, we're going to say you can have your own education. And it wasn't just religion. You can have your own education. Of course, in Quebec, that was going to be Catholic education. You can have your own education. You can have your own social. We'll be part. Uh, we'll unify on the key items. We'll unify with a common defense, a common protection of Republican government, and a single, well, this is probably sensitive in England, I shouldn't mention this, but a single economic union. They were all pushing because they were both, both Franklin and Washington had businesses that crossed state lines. And they realized we can't have each state having its own customs union. We have to have a single monetary union to make America what it could be. I know that's a sensitive issue in England, so I should leave it off. But that's what they believe deeply. And that's what they're pushing in Canada. You can have your own religion, you can have your own schools, you can have your own social things, but we'll be united for defense, we'll be united for um, our economies, we'll be united, and in that way, we can be a great federal union. You can see it all laid out with their proposals with Canada, what they were talking about, Bermuda was in Bahamas were the same way, um, but it, they didn't buy it. They didn't buy it because they really didn't trust it. And I th and it was the opposition of all people to stay with England was led, even though France eventually comes on the side of America, was led by the Catholics, the priests and the big Catholic sort of lords that were had owned the most of the land in the Hudson River Valley. They thought that, you know, staying with England is better than because they didn't quite know what this new federal union in America would turn out to be, would the Puritans control it? And they remember, you know, Puritans, there wasn't a mass said in Mass. It was illegal to say a mass in Massachusetts. There wasn't a mass in Massachusetts until something like the 1790s. Um, uh, and uh, there was a profound anti-Catholicism in, especially in New England, but in, in the United States. And that's what Washington and Franklin were trying to reach across. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Washington shows this again, if I can keep uh, blithering away. When, when he goes to the uh, Constitutional Convention, the day after he's elected as head of the Constitutional Convention, or the weekend after he, um, he's elected, he's elected on Friday, he goes to a Catholic mass in Philadelphia, because Philadelphia, they allowed Catholics. He makes that statement that this is going to be not, we're not going to have an established religion. This country is going to accept all religions. And, and, and it really, when you think about it, that was a remarkable step that immediately after being elected as president of the Constitutional Convention, he goes to a Catholic mass. Well, I want to ask you, Ed, one of the questions that's come in, I can have all the fun. And the first question is, when do they actually first meet in person? Do we know? Um, yes. Well, we think we know. Um, when I charted through all their movements together, it would have been early in the uh, French and Indian War when um, they got together, um, probably together when they were with, at, with both meeting with Braddock. They both were there at the same time when Braddock was preparing his assault. They did get together shortly thereafter when Franklin was setting up the inner, uh, the postal union of the states to deliver um, military dispatches. Um, and Washington also goes up to New York um, to meet with some uh, colonial leaders up there in the military defense. And they pass through Philadelphia together. They also travel together for a while. So the uh, late uh, 
1750s. My book gives the exact dates. Uh, next question has come in from Michael McGee in London. Uh, oh, Michael London. I know Michael London. Michael is our playwright in residence at Benjamin Franklin House, who's based in Ohio. He's written some really good pieces on the relationship between Franklin and his son and um, and other kind of critical issues. Um, one is called A Final Plea about Franklin's uh, choice to try and affect a third way between the interests of the crown and the interests of the colonists. And he says, was there ever a serious conflict? But um, maybe since Michael typed that question, you, you said that in all of the writing, you didn't see any um, disharmony between them. Well, there, yeah, uh, the answer, it's a great question. And no, I don't think there was a serious conflict, but partly the reason there wasn't a serious conflict is by nature, both of these men were compromisers. They both were very pragmatic. Um, you can see it in Washington as a military leader during the revolution. You can see it in uh, their most political leaders. Um, in Washington, in his time in, in Williamsburg as a member of the House of Burgess, uh, Franklin in, in his time in the Pennsylvania legislature as governor of Pennsylvania, where he gets elected twice unanimously and the other time with only one negative vote, um, and um, for three terms as governor. The, um, they try to work with others, and they tried to work with each other always. Now, we can we know they differed over slavery both at the constitutional convention and thereafter and we know that Fra washington was very upset when franklin uses his last public act uh to he'd already been he'd become president of the society for the abolition of slavery while he was still governor of pennsylvania while he was at the constitutional convention and we know he was pressed to raise the issue at the convention, but we know that he made a strategic decision. He figured um, we'll never keep Georgia. Georgia and South Carolina aren't gonna let us abolish slavery now, but we know he thought bring them into the union and then the union can work toward abolishing slavery. And he tries to do that right away with a petition to Congress um, coming from Ben Franklin as, as strong a voice as you could have, the other great American along with Washington. Washington is upset. He thinks that's too quick. They probably had conversations together during the um, during the Constitutional Convention saying because the speeches that Franklin would have wanted to give against slavery were actually delivered by uh, two other delegates um, from Pennsylvania, probably with his blessing. And that's Wilson and um, Governor, not Governor, but Governor Morris, um, who attacked slavery head on at the Constitutional Convention and said, this is what this issue is going to destroy the, the uh, convention. Washington wants to dodge the issue. And in his private letters, when Franklin sends a petition and Washington is president, he just says, I just wish he hadn't brought it up so quickly. Um, we've got to get settled first. And so there, that was a conflict. I don't know if I'd call it serious, uh, but it was Franklin's last chance to speak out on the issue. There were other things where they would you know, they would have somewhat different strategy, but they they always compromised. And in fact, Franklin is one of, there were four people at the Constitutional Convention, four major delegates who said that the, the presidency is way too strong. The original, the original plan, Virginia plan, which both Washington and Franklin had helped draft, um, submitted, would have had much more like a parliamentary democracy, th that is, the original plan would have been that the president, or it wasn't called the president, they didn't have a name for him yet, but the chief executive would be chosen by the legislature, like your prime minister is chosen by the legislature. And it moves toward an independently elected president fitfully over three months. Washington is sort of went along with that Franklin said, well, if we switch, it should be a popular election of the presidency. Washington doesn't want a popular election of the presidency because how would Southern, you know, Northerners would get all these votes um, and South, the slaves couldn't vote. And so it's, that's why the Electoral College was a compromise that allowed the South to get credit for its slaves without letting them vote. Where in the North, I mean, New Jersey even let women vote and Pennsylvania would have too. So if it was a popular vote, 
the North would have overwhelmingly had, had so many more voters because so many Southerners were prohibited from voting um, because they were slaves or because they were women. And so all those issues, they did divide them. But in the end, and that's what I'll close with, um, in the end, while the other opponents, uh, the other people who had broken on the Constitution because the presidency was too powerful and too independent, too much like a king, and Franklin agreed. Franklin said this presidency is at the Constitutional Convention, called it the fetus of, mo the fetus of monarchy. It'll lead to too powerful a president. Um, the other ones who said that, uh, Jerry, who later becomes vice president from Massachusetts, um, uh, Randolph and Mason, two good friends of Washington, they all agree. The three of them vote no. In the end, Washington, uh, Franklin votes yes on the Constitution, but he says he's doing it because he trusts Washington as president. Yes, the presidency is too powerful. It will end in tyranny, he said. It will end in tyranny. This president is too strong, but we got to get going, and I trust Washington as president. So conflict, yeah. Difference of opinion, yes. Serious conflict that really fundamentally divided them, no, because to their last letters together, they spoke of their warm feelings and tremendous veneration of each other. I have to sneak in a question before I ask Alice's, um, which you've touched on already about do they remain lifelong friends? Um, not about Washington and Franklin, but a contemporary question that your response made me think about, which is the Electoral College and its role in U.S. elections, because in a way you can see that that um, did a, a, a good service for states that um, you know, have a large amount of land but not a, a large population, but yet we have had in our experience um, for, um, and I can say this as our because I'm a British subject and also a very proud American citizen, um, where you have someone winning the, um, the, the vote, the popular vote, but then losing the electoral college. So, you know, when you think about the kind of compromises, the bicameral system that was chosen as our system and, and these choices that were made about, you know, having a president calling Washington, you say, Mr. President, rather than, you know, his Royal Highness or his Highness or Highness or whatever uh, fine term uh, you might have addressed him with. What do you think? Putting well, on the spot. Um, Electoral College was, an, I think, probably a necessary compromise back then. Uh, Franklin didn't want it. Washington didn't really want it either. He wanted, a, he, I think, it seems to be that he supported um, uh, Congress picking the president because that was his original proposal. Franklin definitely wanted a direct election of president. Absolutely, he, he thought that. Uh, but it was a compromise that kept in all the states. Um, you know, partly it was that it gave every state three votes. So partly we were, there was this sense under the previous government, the Articles of Confederation, every state had one vote. And so there was a sense of continuing that both in the Electoral College for president and in the Senate where every state gets two votes. Um, and back then, the senators were not elected. They were appointed by their state legislature. So they were very much representatives of their state. Um, we're not the, uh, America's not the only, Australia is even worse because what do they get, 12 uh, senators to every state, including Tasmania? So that makes a very unbalanced, unrepresentative uh, Senate in Australia. But that's true in America as well. Um, the Electoral College, only because we changed things unfair back then, it seemed to be representing the states. But the, the, the notorious part of the Electoral College to me is not that it represents the states um, more heavily than the, but that it allows suppression of votes, which was the original intent, that a state still gets its votes based on its population, not citizens, but population. And yet they can suppress all the votes they wanted in colonial times and in, in revolutionary times and in the early national period. It was not letting, you know, states like, you know, having half their population being slaves and none of them getting to vote or not letting women vote. You could suppress the vote and still get the electoral vote. So to me, the more notorious part of it, historically, as a historian, it's not that a little state like Delaware or a little state like Wyoming gets three electoral votes when a big state like California doesn't get proportionally as much. 
Um, but it's that you, each state can suppress its voting as much as it wants and still gets the full credit in the presidency or full representation in the House of Representatives. Um, but those are just elements of the American compromise. If you look back in England back at that time, England was even worse. It wouldn't let hardly anybody vote. Maybe 3% of the people could vote. And it really wasn't until 100 years later that you began widening the suffrage in England. So, you know, the trouble is England has evolved more. Um, but America or Australia, because they're stuck with a fixed constitution, can't really evolve with the times. And that becomes a real issue. And it's almost important, possible to change the constitution because you need such a super majority. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a factor of American Republican government that we just have to recognize. And those people, and I, I will say though, that those people who say, well, um, Hillary Clinton or, or, or Al Gore got more votes and didn't become president. Yeah, but going in, they knew the rules. And they knew, yeah, it's not a democratic system, but it's the way it works. And uh, so uh, President Trump and President Bush were very smart to play by the rules and put their campaigning into the states like Wisconsin and Michigan, that added up to a majority electoral vote because that's the way the game's played. And I don't care whether you're playing Monopoly or tennis. You've got to, you know, you got to know the rules. The first thing you know is got to know the rules and the net's so high. And you don't toss the ball back and hit a lines person in the middle of the neck and get thrown out. You know the rules. And Trump and Bush knew the rules. And so maybe we'll see over the next does, you know, is Biden going to play for the the uh, uh, popular vote or he's going to play for the electoral vote? So in that sense, I think that Trump and Bush, to my knowledge, well, Bush is a little qu more questionable because of the vote in Florida. But Trump, I think, really won the election because he knew what the rules were. Well, with the time that we have remaining, um, it's kind of leads on from here because you talk the kind of summary um, uh, and there's Alice's question again, but I think we've kind of answered that, that they did, they stayed close friends uh, right up until the very end. But, uh, but they were, you know, when you highlight the legacy that they have, they were partners in the cause of liberty. As you said at the beginning of our talk today, that they, that friendship helped to found a nation and I found um, in the, the ending to your book, it was quite uh, interesting and poignant when you look at the fact that they were, what really drew them together, they were hardworking, they were national leaders, they were successful entrepreneurs, um, they listened more than they spoke, they were reformers, um, they saw problems, they tried to fix them. Um, and they willingly gave up their public roles. And, and surely that's been a hallmark of our um, you know, of the of the United States is a peaceful transition of power. Um, so I, I thought I'd just highlight those points. And then with the last minutes that we have, if you can tell us, um, Benjamin Franklin left George Washington something. What was it? Oh, Did yes. And that, that in, indirectly sort of answers Alice's question. Yeah, they remained lifelong. I don't know if close would have ever been the right term, but friends and admirers. They were friends and admirers. And so for, what, for Franklin at the end, um, Franklin had lots of grandchildren and he was a very close family person. He was devoted to his family. Um, I know he had his problems with his one son, but um, they were very close before that. But he makes an exception and he had received a very precious, to him a very precious, a French noble woman had given him when the revolution was taking hold and it looked like there was gonna be freedom. She had given him a, a walking stick that looked like a scepter. It was a beautiful carved from a um, from a wild crab apple tree. It was sort of bent and carved, and it had a crown. But in, on the crown of it, there was a liberty cap, which was a symbol of the most radical Republican rule, the liberty cap. And it was already coming in vogue in France. And she gave that to them. And it was a it's a beautiful item. You can still see it. And um, it was like a scepter, but a scepter of liberty. And where Franklin and Washington were so similar is they were both children in the Enlightenment. They both believed in this new vision of Republican government. Maybe not total democratic government, but Republican government, ultimately the people. And they were both were going to go 
were served for a period of time, but not like monarchs. He rised up because of their ability and raised up and then go back down amongst the people. And here for in his will, he gave this, this stick, which, you know, technically isn't worth anything, but technically is worth everything to Washington. And it was delivered to him. And Washington, it just humbled him. He just loved it. Here was this, this scepter. And it reminded me of in the Old Testament where the prophets um, in, um, 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 inaugurated um, King Saul and then King David. And um, it was like this, the older prophet giving this scepter, the scepter of liberty with the, with the, with the liberty cap crown on top of this um, wild, they both, both of them were nature lovers. Both of them love plants. Both of them were close to nature. Both of them have plants named after them. Both were gardeners. And this wild apple tree turned into a scepter with a liberty uh, uh, cap crown. And it was so symbolic. And both men, since neither of them were good speakers, both showed their beliefs by actions more than their their words. They were In that way, they were different, say, from Jefferson. Um, and whose actions never lived up to his words. Their, their actions exceeded their words in both cases. And here was an act, a final act of giving this uh, scepter of liberty to the new president, who, who Franklin tremendously supported, pushed for Washington's election. And, uh, and I just thought it was a wonderful fit and fitting clothes, and it felt that way to Washington as well. Ed, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing this important story with us and um, look forward to your future books to come. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to when this ends and I can be in London and see you and visit the Franklin House again. Thank you so much. Wonderful.